Good afternoon. Welcome to the session, Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr., Nature, People, and Places. The presentations this afternoon are structured quite purposefully to help us to better understand nature, people, and places through the eyes and work of Frederick Olmsted. We have assembled an outstanding team of professionals. They are Robert Yarrow, Eric Tamulanis, Dan Jones, and Philip Morris. As we contemplate the contribution of Olmsted, it is clear that his social consciousness shaped a continuing legacy to nature, people, and places personified in a very simple idea. The idea that a public park is common green space and that must be accessible to all citizens. This session draws on these ideals and principles, linking them to contemporary applications to build new park systems and interconnected parkways, focusing on the design of the whole from the neighborhood to the city to the region. Today, more than ever, cities including New York, Atlanta, Chicago, and Madrid are embracing Olmsted's legacy through major redevelopment of their city's core, focusing on the creation and reconnection of green space to foster economic vitality, healthy communities, and places of choice. I was struck some years back when visiting Madrid to find they were removing their innermost ring road, the M30, and placing it underground. In 2004, it was determined that the 22-mile road was a barrier to movement in Madrid's urban areas. The Madrid M30 project was undertaken to reroute major sections of that roadway through tunnels under the city. Placing the road underground allows the surface areas that used to be asphalt to be redeveloped into green parks, footpaths, cycle paths, and new affordable housing. Atlanta, a city which enjoys the Olmsted Linear Parkway greenways along Ponce de Leon between Briarcliff and East Lake Roads, is restructuring its city's core through the Beltline, a network of parks, trails, and transit on a 22-mile former railroad corridor circling Atlanta's downtown neighborhoods. Olmsted's continuing legacy and these extensions increase community social connections and provide the opportunity for different types of people to interact and engage in social and physical activity, enhancing a community's overall well-being. With that, Robert, would you please come forward? Thank you, Catherine. Um, well, this has been very exciting. Uh, Lori, really appreciated your presentation, and, uh, and uh, I had the honor of working early in my career with Char Charles Elliott II when he was in, in his 80s and when we resurrected the Bay Circuit around Boston. And uh, uh, so I guess that's one degree of separation, or maybe two, I don't know, pretty good. So uh, at any rate, wonderful to be here in this August uh, company, and it's really nice to uh, kind of reconnect uh, with the with NAOP and you know again early in my career I uh, worked in restoring I was right out of school a year out of school Walnut Hill Park in New Britain Connecticut which was one of the Olmsted firm's uh, seniors first projects and then later uh, got to work on the restoration of the, the the Boston park system and then and then later statewide across Massachusetts the Olmsted Park system and, and uh, so at any rate and and really fun to get into the the uh, uh, the life and achievements of Olmsted Jr. who it turns out when we all dug into this thing had a whole different view of planning and the role that planning uh, played in in the design of cities and regions and so uh, when when I got the call to come today uh, and was asked to take a look at Olmsted Jr.'s role in in regional plan associations, first regional plan, uh, it was a very exciting opportunity for me to go back through our archives and begin to understand what he had done. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, this place, the tri-state region of New York, and and uh, and this organization, the Regional Plan Association, uh, which was 
created uh, to, uh, to uh, develop and then implement the, the regional plan for New York and its environs. Uh, beginning between 1922 and 1929, RPA developed the first uh, strategic uh, metropolitan plan in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, Olmsted uh, Jr. was on the staff throughout that period and, uh, and led uh, uh, both the regional survey for Long Island, uh, uh, a, 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 as well as uh, in partnership with, with many others. Uh, and, and again, this was a collaborative process. And I have the list of, of some of the luminaries with whom Olmsted, Olmsted worked. Uh, the regional plan was, was well, it was initiated by uh, Charles Dyer Norton uh, and Fred, Frederick Delano, and they're well known to those of you who, from Chicago because they, they were the chair and co-chair of the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club uh, who uh, convened uh, the, the Burnham Plan for Chicago. They both knew, moved to New York uh, soon after the First World War and uh, decided that uh, New York needed something like the Chicago plan, but on a larger scale. The, the region was twice the size of, of, of the Chicago region and was growing at an even faster rate. Um, and the other luminaries involved were, were uh, uh, the, the, the staff, staff director was Thomas Adams, uh, who, who was the founder of the Royal Town Planning Institute, uh, very active in planning both in the UK, uh, US, and Canada, uh, had a great deal uh, which I've th tried to emulate. Uh, his contract included uh, two round-trip uh, first-class Cunard tickets to get back and forth to visit mom. Uh, in, and uh, I haven't been able to get my, my board to agree to that, but, I, but I'd love to, you know, what a pretty good deal. Um, and uh, Edward Bassett, who uh, w was on staff, uh, the, the man who, who led the creation of the, the 1916 zoning resolution in New York City, you know, America's first uh, zoning scheme. Uh, later wrote the uh, planning uh, or the Zoning Enabling Act uh, for, for President Hoover. That was back when Republicans were progressives. And uh, even God, imagine looking up to Herbert Hoover as an emplar for what, exemplar for what a progressive Republican might. Uh, uh, John Nolan, uh, who was one of the, the town planner, uh, Robert uh, Murray Haig, who developed the first uh, uh, long range uh, economic uh, forecasts and employment forecasts. Uh, 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 and, and, and others, uh, Clarence Perry, the originator of the neighborhood unit. This was the kind of collaboration that Olmsted Jr. was looking for in his career. The most talented group of engineers, planners, scientists, uh, architects, landscape architects, town planners, I think ever assembled up until that point other than maybe in the Olmsted office. And, uh, uh, but uh, but, a, but a, a, a tremendous amount of ferment among these folks. Now conveniently, uh, Fred Delano uh, succeeded Norton in 1925 as the chair of the regional plan. Uh, and the convenient part is that three years later, he, he involved his nephew who had been, uh, been stricken by polio uh, and was looking for things to do and involved him in the committee on the regional plan. So, uh, so Franklin Delano Roosevelt became involved in this process, became governor of New York in 1928 and of course president in 1932. And, and so many of the problems of implementation uh, were aided by two things. One was that, was that in 1929, this ad hoc group, the Committee on the Regional Plan, incorporated as Regional Plan Association Incorporated. And, and, and one of the things I like to have been thinking here all day is that this entire conference, except for Lori's presentation, was past tense. Olmsted did this, Olmsted did that, and so forth. And the work that we do at Regional Plan is past tense, but it's also present and future tense. I mean, we're still doing it. And one of the principles that Olmsted Jr. advocated uh, in this ad hoc committee was that this had to become a permanent uh, uh, fixture in, in the civic community of New York because it took decades and sometimes generations to implement the, the bold visions and investment proposals that were being developed in the plan. So again, we've all seen these definitions. You know, this was a man who was thinking beyond the kind of grand vision of his father and, and thinking, you know, thinking grand visions, but also thinking about, uh, about how the visions could be fully integrated into uh, the, the, the life and functionality of states and regions and cities. One of the things that he advocated in the regional plan was this idea then crazy outlandish idea that every municipality in the tri-state region needed to have a planning commission 
to adopt and then implement their own community plans. Um, he also, and, and the, the first regional plan, if you get to look at it, it's this majestic, you know, uh, it's about a 12 volume document that came out over a period of three or four years, um, it, but it includes a set of model regulations for subdivision regulations, for zoning regulations, for the planning of communities, growing communities at the edge of the region, for established communities at the core of the region. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite essays is one that Olmsted Jr. wrote on open space zoning. It sounds like something that might have been written in, you know, by a smart growth advocate and, you know, a, a year or two ago. But, he, but visionary stuff, and then a, again for, for uh, 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 Alex Garvin might have written it, who knows, right? Probably did. And uh, um, at any rate, uh, and, and so, so the idea was to, was to take the, the, the vision and then make sure that it was built into the, inf the permanent uh, institutions of, of the region. There weren't any institutions for planning in the region at that time, and so this was bold, visionary stuff. And then this notion that, that it wasn't just about open spaces and, and parks and parkways, it was about, about fully, about, really it was, a, I think what we, we today would think of as the public realm. It was really thinking about how you could take streets, sidewalks, boulevards, public spaces, parks and so forth, and use that to create a permanent framework for, for the growth of cities and towns and regions. Um, uh, the first thing that Olmsted did, and it was the, the, the back in those days, uh, regional planning uh, started with uh, what they called a regional survey, and uh, and Olmsted was charged with developing the survey for Lo for Long Island, the growing areas of Long Island, which included most of Queens and the Nassau and Suffolk counties, and uh, and he spent uh, a majestic year driving around uh, uh, the wilds of Long Island and identifying the most important natural resource systems, uh, looking at the town centers, looking at the the framework that the Long Island Railroad created and ended up uh, in this survey, ended up proposing a network of parks and parkways uh, that uh, uh, that that could uh, that that could shape the growth of Long Island, in, you know, from Queens East uh, to to Montauk. Uh, uh, now there were some really powerful people who got behind these ideas. One of them was uh, Robert Moses in the upper right hand corner here. Uh, he had been uh, uh, Governor Smith's uh, state parks director. He got to know Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Fred Delano through his uh, through Roosevelt's uh, participation in the, in the in the Hudson Valley Park Commission and so forth. And so what this meant was that the ideas in the plan weren't just part of a majestic document, weren't just being advocated by a by a civic group, but really were embraced by the governor of New York and then later by Robert Moses. Now Moses uh, never gave RPA any credit for any of it because he was incapable of giving anybody any credit for anything, and so other than the great man himself, but, but most of the parks and parkways that Moses developed were in fact you know, proposed in, in, the, in, the, in the first regional plan. I should back up here and just go back to uh, this, this drawing here, and you can see the network of parks and parkways, really the first time that in the country that a, that a whole metropolitan area uh, uh, had a long-range strategy for protecting uh, uh, important landscapes and providing recreational access and so forth. And at this point, they, the, the Westchester Parkway system was being developed. It was very clear that the widespread ownership of automobiles, that the parkways were going to be used as, as arterials and that, and that the, the, the notion was that people would be commuting on them and, and then on, during the week and then on weekends they would be using the parkways to get out to the new parks at the edge of the region. And uh, Moses took that idea and ran with it with a vengeance. Um, Farrell LaGuardia was, the, of course, the mayor and then FDR, you know, and, and uh, 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 who, who referred to Frederick Delano as Uncle Fred, uh, you know, saw to it that the, that the, that the plan was large largely implemented, uh, the, the, uh, Roosevelt adopted a, uh, the idea that in 1929, after the, after the stock market crashed, that, the, that these public works projects could be a, a place to employ large numbers of New Yorkers, created a model program for public works employment uh, as governor, which he then wrote into the White House. And of course, by, during the 1930s, uh, uh, New York received an inordinate share of WPA and PWA funding and the rest of it, all the alphabet soup of the New Deal, investing in, in developing the infrastructure projects and parks and parkways and so forth in the in the regional plan, we were the only place in the country with with uh, with preliminary designs done on all of these on the bridges and tunnels and parks and parkways and so forth. So it became a logical thing. We did a second plan in the 1960s, which took some of the same ideas, really rounding out the 
the, the open space system, uh, the first uh, urban national parks with Gateway National Recreation Area, Fire Island, um, and, and uh, the Upper Delaware, uh, uh, a network of state parks in all three states. Uh, and then uh, the, a project called the Race for Open Space that Holly White, William H. White uh, led, uh, which, which proposed the creation of state um, uh, open space programs and open space bonds in all three states. The idea that we had to get there to protect open space before the subdividers did. Uh, and then the idea of creating a network of land trusts across the region, starting with the, the Reading Land Trust in Connecticut that Holly White worked with, which became a template for the National Land Trust movement. And you know, the result is that several million acres of open space have been protected over, over time. And these are some of the places, Fire Island, Abitawaska, and Island Beach, and others. Uh, I got to RPA in 1989 to lead the third regional plan, and we had this you know, cr uh, zany idea that we could ramp this up another level and, and, and uh, develop a network of 11 regional reserves, large protected landscapes, uh, each one with a regional uh, land use regulatory uh, plan and a land use regulatory commission. And we've got five of the 11 in place, uh, starting with the Long Island Pine Barrens, the New York City watersheds uh, in the Catskills in the Delaware River, uh, the Jersey Highlands and others. And, and one of the big ideas was that, was that we could also go into a place like the Hudson River uh, estuary in New York Harbor and, and reclaim uh, and, and uh, reuse uh, uh, urban waterfronts. Uh, uh, Alex is the only guy in the room who will notice that my staff mislabeled the uh, you know, what is the East River Park, but it's the other side of the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, one park is the same as the other, it's a, and, uh, but it's the East River Park, but, but, a, but a network of urban, urban parks, and Mr. Garvin and his former boss, Mr. Doktoroff, uh, ran with this idea, and, and it, we've got more new waterfront parks in New York than just about any place in the universe, I think, as a result of this idea. Um, we're also working on a fourth regional plan now, which is going to be looking at how we adapt to climate change, how we adapt these big open space systems, um, and again, integrating uh, 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 planning for, for protection of the natural resources and open spaces in the larger context of economic development, urban development, and so forth. So this Olmsted Junior tradition uh, lives on. And again, we owe him an enormous debt at RPA, and I think across the country, an enormous debt to Mr. Olmsted for the vision that he provided to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to carry on in uh, Bob's vein here in the genealogy of Olmsteadian tradition here and say that uh, by virtue of the fact that I spent two years in Laurie's office and Laurie himself as a self-confessed third generation Olmsteadian relation, I am therefore fourth generation. So, <laughs> so we find the connection continuing along here. Uh, we are charged on this panel to look at, at how the Olmsteadian vision uh, has progressed forward uh, into the 21st century. And uh, while some of this work occurs in New York and around the other country, uh, I'll be focusing more on the stories of uh, two cities, uh, Louisville and Birmingham, if I can get there, uh, which have a, an interesting story each uh, in its own way. So what I will do is begin to set the context for these and do a little bit of a comparison and contrast. Uh, and then I'll turn over to my uh, colleagues, uh, Philip Morris and Dan Jones, who will describe the uh, more detail of what's happening presently. Uh, but I, I think that over the past uh, almost going on a decade now in work with uh, Dan and his team and, and Philip and the community in uh, Birmingham, uh, what we have seen is that in these cities and other cities across the country, this sense of Olmsteadian ambition and optimism, I think, is reborn uh, at this period at a time more so than it has been perhaps since that early flush of park construction uh, in the early part of the century. There are parks that are redeveloping in the urban cores. We are turning to the waterfronts, as, as Bob mentioned. And we're also turning to the growth areas uh, to understand how, in an Olmsteadian tradition, uh, large parks can help to structure, uh, by virtue of green infrastructure, uh, the growth of communities and provide a blueprint for the future. And some of these parks are extraordinary. And I think that has been mentioned, uh, Fresh Kills uh, Landfill Park, uh, other parks like Shelby Farms uh, Park, Orange County Great Park, the two parks we'll talk about today, Red Mountain Park, and the parklands of Floyd's Fork. These are parks of thousands of acres. They're parks uh, not necessarily in the center of the city, but sometimes on the periphery, which are, in a sense, sort of climate, generating their own climate, 
uh, generating a game-changing aspect uh, to communities and providing a new dimension, which I think is entirely uh, in keeping with the, the Olmstedian tradition of using open space and, as Alex mentioned, the public realm uh, to shape the future growth in, in communities. Uh, Louisville here on the left, uh, shown in its point of pride here, its uh, riverfront uh, city here. Uh, this is the River City uh, in about 1876. Uh, you can see it here it is founded uh, since, I guess, 1780 as a frontier uh, trading port uh, at the Falls of the Ohio, the great glorious portage around there, eventually growing to become a manufacturing city. Uh, now, as we know it, uh, a city uh, famous for horses, famous for bourbon, and uh, trying to kick its nicotine habit. <laughs> Uh, but it's moving on, uh, like many cities, to a, a, new, a new era, and uh, by virtue of its uh, self-titled uh, term, uh, the City of Parks, uh, Louisville is looking to open space to help define its identity. Uh, it has grown uh, and fluctuated in its population from time, so these are two cities of about a quarter million population right now, uh, set within a county, the surrounding county, of roughly 600 to 700,000 people. Uh, and that fluctuation in the city growth has gone up and down as high as 300,000, but now uh, declining. Uh, the population growth has moved out to the counties, which sets the stage for the sense of these uh, park systems that have to define the growth of these. When we look at uh, Birmingham, Birmingham is also on a river, but it's in, in this case a river of steel. Uh, dry as a bone, uh, Birmingham is located where it is because of the coincidence of iron ore, uh, limestone and coal, uh, all used to create, uh, to fuel the furnaces and the conversion of iron to steel, uh, creating Birmingham as the Pittsburgh of the South, a booming economy that was so explosive it was called the Magic City. The city virtually sprung up in a matter of decades. And like Louisville, growing by 20 or 25 percent a year, uh, the city fathers in both cities uh, turned to the planning profession, the design profession, to understand how they could emulate some of the cities that they used as their role models. By this time, of course, Boston and other cities, uh, uh, Chicago and Buffalo, uh, developed their park systems largely. So they used these as points of comparison and, and thought that this might be a good idea to look at in their own communities. Uh, in the case of Louisville, it was right in the 1890s at the end of uh, Frederick Olmsted Sr.'s career. Uh, and the, the firm was invited to uh, prepare plans for three parks. Uh, and as a course of that, uh, as Olmsted finally declined uh, and his son, Frederick Olmsted Jr., uh, took over, uh, we reach the point where we have the, the question of authorship. And as Arlene uh, Levy has pointed out, these are not necessarily plans designed and stewarded by Frederick Olmsted Jr. himself, but in the source of a subject that will probably be uh, uh, held in future symposia, uh, the partners uh, carried on this tradition, and presumably under the guidance, under the philosophy. But nevertheless, there's a whole cadre of people who are unsung heroes, in a sense, carrying on the tradition uh, in Louisville from the 1890s through to the 1950s. Uh, in developing the park system. Uh, in Birmingham, uh, this was in the 1920s, uh, square in the middle of the boosterism era, uh, they, they sought out the Olmsted firm uh, and looked to Frederick Olmsted uh, after the uh, tenure of Warren Manning, who prepared a city plan for the city uh, and eventually f uh, phased out. But as the uh, director of the park commission uh, sought out Frederick Olmsted Jr., uh, we have in the body of correspondence this uh, interesting uh, point that all of you consultants out there will be amused by. Uh, which is the, the chairman of the Park uh, Commission beseeching Frederick Olmsted to pay attention to him and to come out. And when will you come out? When will you leave California to come and, and pay attention to us? Uh, and, who, and if not you, who from your firm? So Olmsted re replies, he says, well, I can't be there, uh, but my uh, colleague Edward Whiting will be there. The next letter says, well, uh, Mr. Whiting is in Louisville. He's unable to get to, to Birmingham, <laughs> so there's a problem. So even now, there's this challenge of trying to serve several clients. Uh, but this tradition carried on, uh, and as we, as we see, and we take a little bit more uh, uh, depth in looking at the, the park system as originally conceived, on the left we see Louisville's uh, three parks, the toned areas there, uh, indicating uh, the parks there, designed uh, on a sketch uh, by the Salma Gundy Club, a group of civic leaders who wanted to do this park uh, uh, concept, uh, hired Olmsted to look at it, and he created a system which then united these uh, parks with a set of parkways. Uh, sadly, there's no Olmstedian drawing that puts all this together. So if anyone has such a drawing, please let us know because it seems to be missing uh, or maybe non-existent. On the right, we see Frederick Olmsted Jr.'s office's uh, version of the regional plan for the Birmingham area. There's also a city plan that Philip will show, but this shows, I think, again, the sense of, of uh, expansion that's been mentioned many times uh, of the vision of understanding the, the landscape concept uh, of open space. 
Uh, looking at the green ribbons there, they follow in a northeast and southwest direction uh, the Ridgeon Valley province uh, in which uh, Birmingham is located. Birmingham is essentially a mountain town, uh, and these uh, green ribbons here follow the, the greenways and the watercourses there, which were relatively cheap land, relatively troubled land, and really uh, unconstrained by the dominant force that drove uh, Birmingham, which was the mineral rights uh, uh, and the lumber and the forests and the coal mines uh, that were in the mountains. So ridgetops at that point were not a part of the, uh, uh, the, the open space plan. Uh, unlike Birmingham, uh, Louisville was implemented almost in its entirety. Uh, the Olmsted firm practiced there and executed about 175 or more commissions, uh, thank you to the Olmsted uh, register here, uh, about half of which were uh, residential. Uh, on the other hand, Birmingham uh, executed about uh, 25 commissions there, and this uh, open space plan was really not well implemented uh, at all for various reasons that perhaps Philip will uh, illuminate. If we project this forward now to the, uh, uh, the 20th century, we have now the, the vision, as we see on the left, of, of the two park systems as they've evolved. Uh, this being uh, superimposing the original plan for the parks in downtown Louisville uh, on the Jefferson County plan, Jefferson County surrounding Louisville. Uh, the catalyst for the open space plan in Jefferson County currently uh, was the merger of the, count of the, the city and county uh, into one municipal body, uh, and that drove a sense of, of continuity in the park system that hadn't been seen prior to that. Uh, on the right, we see what's called the Red, Red Rock Ridge and Valley uh, map, which was the, the current evolution of thinking that, that took the Olmsted planning and brought it forward to the 21st century and merged it with the idea of public health uh, and recreation. Uh, these two plans uh, also are, are sort of coincident with the movement that occurred in both cities to reinvest in the downtown. Uh, on the left, we see uh, George Hargreaves' work at Louisville Waterfront Park, uh, surrounded by a halo of redevelopment, uh, really as a, a sort of a poster child for this idea of how to connect to, to the water uh, and how to use that as a catalyst to, to spur urban development. On the right, we see uh, Birmingham's twin, also on its river, its river of steel in this case, the railroad reservation, which were the huge rail yards that occupied the center of Birmingham, uh, now occupied by Tom Leader Studios' work, a beautiful park that is also driving redevelopment around it. But the story here uh, extends beyond the city, extends out to the, the uh, outer areas of the counties, and that's sort of where the game is at the moment. Uh, the uh, Louisville metro area uh, is being driven by the idea of a, a, a circumferential walkway of about 300, or excuse me, 100 miles uh, that will move around the outside, the perimeter of the uh, county, uniting the major landscapes of the county, a concept developed by my colleague David Rouse, who I think sits among us today uh, during the course of our planning on, uh, for the comprehensive plan uh, in Louisville Metro. Uh, during the course of the Red Rock Ridge and Valley uh, province uh, discussion, that was the idea of using uh, a, an entire uh, pathway system following the greenways, linking communities, and providing a sense of continuity in a somewhat balkanized area. But outside this, uh, we see the, the major parks, the parklands of Floyd's Fork, uh, and uh, in Birmingham's case, Red Mountain Park, located on the, the periphery of the growth uh, area in the cities, uh, forming sort of a bridge between the city and the suburban world. Uh, as we look now uh, more closely at Louisville on a transition to, to Dan's discussion here, uh, this is the park system map uh, of the 1990s, uh, which shows a, a smattering of parks uh, scattered around here, and perhaps more poetically illustrated here, showing the county within its landscape setting, and showing the ring around the outer part of the county, uh, which became the focus of some of the work uh, that's currently going on. But looking quickly at where the Olmsted parks uh, sit, reside within this, uh, the Eminent Olmsted Parks of Shawnee, uh, Cherokee, and Iroquois Parks uh, were the parks that represented the major landscapes of the Louisville area. Uh, the Ohio River for Shawnee Park, Beargrass Creek, and then no the Knobs uh, in Iroquois Park representing the hills. So we have river, hills, and creek in the initial uh, Olmsted concept uh, for open space. These were purchased uh, within the city limits, uh, or excuse me, outside the city limits. The mayor at that point, uh, Mayor Jacobs, was uh, perceived as, as an object of derision at that point. Uh, the whole enterprise of buying this parkland outside of the urban uh, area was called Jacob's Folly. So we, we see this sense of uh, perhaps lack of foresight on the part of the civic group, but the mayor himself saw the, the advantage of this because indeed the city grew immediately past them. And now the movement is out in the periphery of the county because the county is growing gradually eastward. Uh, the big landscapes are united here by the Louisville Loop uh, which extends around the periphery, and this pulls together uh, the waterfront by virtue of Waterfront Park, the next generation of big parks here, the Floyd's Fork Valley, uh, occupied by the parklands of Floyd's Fork, and then Jefferson Memorial uh, Forest, 
uh, which occupies the knobs, the, the hills there. So the sense of Olmstedian uh, vision for a relationship to a core landscape has been expanded now out to the county and forms the growth structure for the next ring of development. So Dan will now talk a little, little bit further about the uh, Floyd's Fork uh, Valley. Oh, that's the right button. All right, well, good afternoon um, and thank you. I'm Dan Jones. I'm the founder and CEO of 21st Century Parks, um, which as Eric uh, noted, uh, we're building about a 4,000 acre addition to Louisville's public park system. Um, I wanna preface my remarks uh, in, to this audience by saying I am not a landscape architect, nor am I an urban planner. So um, what I know about Olmstead um, is mostly self-taught uh, and uh, kind of uh, grappling with the challenges of building a new park system and sort of making reference to the history. My uh, professional background, I was originally trained as a PhD academic in the history of the American West. I fled academia very quickly um, and became a real estate developer for 15 years and working on the edge among other places and uh, increasingly realizing that we were not doing what we had done so well 100 years uh, before um, which was to really get ahead of uh, the growth of the city uh, and put in infrastructure. So I'm going to structure my talk around sort of five principles that I see as central um, to Frederick Law Olmsted uh, Jr. Um, and they are as follows. So I'm going to tell them to you, then I'll, as I go through my talk, I'll point them out. Um, the first one, uh, and I think this is, this is uh, not so much a principle as an observation, uh, but it's this. Um, the urbanizing world of the 21st century, the global uh, trend in urbanization, to me is directly analogous to the world faced by the Olmsteads in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, therefore, these lessons are critical. Um, they are not simply a matter of the past, they are very much just a matter of the present and especially the future, and they are applicable. Um, if the world hopes to build cities that are healthy, green, economically vibrant and livable. So to me, um, these, these principles live every day um, and uh, should be, you know, as this conference is doing, broadcast uh, more broadly. Uh, the second point is this. Uh, parks to us are city shaping infrastructure of equal importance to other kinds of built infrastructure, sewers, roads, power lines, whatever it might be, and should be designed and implemented ahead of the growth of the city. And again, that is a, a, a concept that I attribute uh, to, Frederick Law, to the Olmsteads and it's, uh, particularly Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. Uh, the third point is that systemic park design, that is not building sort of parks one at a time, but really thinking uh, broadly and, and systematically, along with the connective tissues of transportation corridors, parkways, bike paths, et cetera, is superior to individual isolated park design. So again, that's a, a key principle that we try to apply in our work. Um, the fourth point is that strong park design should include consideration of the interface with surrounding development at minimum, and at its best should take into consideration the types of surrounding development and the connections between uh, that public infrastructure, that public realm that others have referred to, and that uh, surrounding private development. And last but not least, um, and this one I guess is my, my uh, stab at controversy, but I think th there are some critics uh, today who say that, that this kind of sort of very high quality architectural park work um, is the work of elites that um, really doesn't apply to uh, people more broadly. I could not disagree with that more strongly. On September the 6th, we opened essentially two full parks, and in the month of September, in about three weeks, we had 133,000 visits, um, at which, uh, you know, and very diverse economically, ethnically, and so on, and consistently in that was a response to the quality of the design and the architecture. So again, I think one of the, these key principles to me of, of Olmsted Jr. and his father as well was that uh, great architecture, great design matters. Right, we'll see if I hit the button right the first time. All right, so um, our organization is 21st Century Parks. The, the project we call the Parklands of Floyd's Fork, which is uh, about almost 4,000 acre 
uh, park system. Uh, we acquired that land in about 80 separate real estate transactions uh, conducted over a seven-year period with no government condemnation. We are a private nonprofit. All of the land transactions uh, were private transactions. Um, we've raised to date uh, over $120 million, $121 million, uh, so the project is fully funded. Uh, we broke ground in 2010 and the entire project, almost 4,000 acres, four parks connected along a 15-mile corridor, is on schedule to be built and open to the public by the end of 2015. Um, this is Floyd's Fork itself, uh, very typical, very beautiful Kentucky stream. Uh, there are thousands of them uh, in, in Kentucky, but only one is 20 minutes from downtown in Kentucky's largest urban area, and that's Floyd's Fork. So it's a wonderful geographic feature, and it is the, the focal point, the central geographic feature. Uh, we always try to follow it. Um, we have a wonderful uh, set of natural landscapes out there, incredible geology, incredible uh, fossil beds, some of the best Ordovician fossil beds in the world. So there's a great natural history that is the context for this project. Um, for 200 years, Jefferson County, where Louisville's located, was an agricultural economy. So there's also a great set of cultural landscapes out there that the design team uh, wanted to bring into this project. So again, these just give you a little sense of what it looks like. And last but not least, we are out on the edge of what I call the suburban frontier. Um, I was a frontier historian. Uh, actually, the, the model works. Uh, there's a lot of uh, commonalities. Um, but how we integrate with that, how we shape development, uh, is obviously integral to the project. And I think, we've, as we've heard from all the speakers today, integral to the thought of Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr. Um, so. Uh, we, think, we think infrastructure matters, and if you put it in first, uh, parks are infrastructure, uh, it's going to make for a better city. Um, secondly, we don't claim any uh, authorship of the big idea in this, that is getting out ahead of the city. We simply are trying to relearn what the Olmsteads taught us. And uh, what you see in this uh, map is in the center, that little white blob was Louisville in about 1890, and the original Olmsted plan laid out those three parks and connecting parkways. And then the city grew around it, which is the faint oval you see. So we're simply trying to do that again. Um, and what you see in green there is that collection of 80 parcels of now con the fully connected land. And the broader circle represents our belief that really it's our observation. Because truth be told, Louisville is behind where we were in the 1890s. Uh, there's already been a lot of growth on the edge. But basically, that we want to use this project to shape the growth of the city. So we say our primary mission is to create a world-class systemic addition to Louisville's public park system, but done right, Louisville can have the finest urban edge in America. And you may challenge me and say, well, how can Louisville do that? Um, I can't tell you that we'll do it, but I can guarantee to you that if we don't put this kind of green infrastructure in, uh, in place first, we will never do it. So out of that, uh, uh, those uh, that almost 4,000 acres of land, Eric and his colleagues at WRT, with some local partners, created a system, again, that systemic uh, idea of four different parks. And these are not simply geographic distinctions. Each park has its own design uh, and recreational philosophy, its own set of sort of conditions and so on, but uh, they are all integrated uh, through connecting infrastructure, a park road, a, a bike path, a canoe trail, and so on, and they essentially cut north to south through the eastern third of Louisville Metro, which is the fastest growing part of the city. Um, each one, uh, the original Olmsted parks used Native American tribal names to demonstrate even their naming the idea of a system. Uh, we like that idea, so we use tributary names. So Beckley Creek Park, Popelick Park. Uh, we have a little piece of connecting infrastructure. The red line, by the way, is the Louisville Loop, the bike path Eric mentioned, uh, and then Turkey Run and Broad Run. Um, and that's just, again, kind of shows you the system uh, in toto. Um, one of the goals that we did as part of the master plan, and it's a, really a great struggle with the city to try to implement this, is to begin to think, okay, when this project is in place and open, how do you begin to extend it up into the surrounding neighborhoods? And Eric and his colleagues did a great job of beginning to imagine that not only will we reforest and restore along Floyd's Fork and the main stem, but we'll do that up the tributaries and we'll add paths up the tributaries. So as development occurs around it, people can come into these parks uh, by foot, by bike, and so on, and not just in their cars. So this reflects various ways of conceptualizing that integration 
with surrounding development. Um, this next couple slides are just to give you a little sense of, of what's happening. Um, this, is, uh, um, this is Floyd's Fork. Uh, we do have a paddling trail of about 25 miles. Uh, that it's 15 miles as the crow flies, about 23 to 25. Um, as the river flows, so that's 20 minutes from downtown in the top 50 metro area, heavily used already. Um, this is the Egg Lawn, which is kind of one of the central um, uh, places within uh, the project. Um, just a small overlook on a lake. Uh, this is our playground and spray ground. Um, this is really the engine of Beckley Creek Park. It is absolutely amazing how many people uh, facilities like this bring out, as you all well know. Um, uh, to the right is the Geens Foundation Lodge, which is a, a sort of large building that we built right on the edge of the creek. This is one of the few places uh, that were out of the 100-year floodplain. Um, it's a wonderful amenity. We can host all kinds of events. It's also a money earner for us. It's a way for us to help fund uh, the, the operations and maintenance of the park. Um, this is uh, the kind of south of the Egg Lawn, the Grand Alley. You can see the park road bending to the left, the Louisville Loop um, bending to the right. Um, so very strong sort of landscape level features in the design of this. This is the alley up close. We can host festivals, um, farmers markets, all kinds of things. Um, there's a, we, a nice restored wetland. Uh, the only hydric soil is actually in the whole site. Um, we used a lot of uh, sort of traditional Kentucky vernacular architectural uh, themes, the dry laid stone walls being a very prominent one. Um, the trail, the bike path goes through all kinds of different landscapes, uh, you know, riverine, riparian, and then up into some really lovely woodlands. Uh, we built four uh, major bridges, that is car and bike path bridges. Uh, these are, you know, very strong architectural statements, um, kind of paying homage to the, the kind of infrastructure that the Olmsteads um, advocated for within their parks, and again, with that very high architectural vision. Um, we will build a very large uh, catenary or suspension bridge in the south, a pedestrian bridge, a way of getting people up into the treetops. That's in phase four, uh, which is currently under construction. Um, Turkey Run Park uses almost all existing farm buildings that are adaptively reused, so it's uh, still very intentional architecture, but a completely different um, uh, vision than what you saw in Beckley Creek. So we recap the silo, it becomes an overlook, the tobacco barn becomes a picnic pavilion. Etc. So, um, just to recap, um, my five uh, principles: uh, what, Olm what the Olmsteads taught us, and I think particularly the systematization done by Frederick Law Jr. and the professionalization, um, uh, the world that they dealt with, where Americans were pouring into the cities, is directly analogous to what is happening in the rest of the world. Um, except in this case, rather than millions, it's billions. Um, so these lessons, to me, are real. Uh, they're applicable, and it is critically important that they, that they are learned and transferred, uh, transferred to these places that are urbanizing rapidly. Um, parks are city-shaping infrastructure. Uh, McKinsey wrote a big report on infrastructure and urbanization in China. They didn't mention parks once. Okay? In my mind, that's a mistake. Um, parks do best when they're designed as systems. Uh, strong desi park design should include interfaces, uh, the interface with what goes on around it. Uh, and again, uh, bringing great architecture, uh, architectural vision and design um, is not just sort of a side issue. It is fundamental to creating parks that are going to be here for 100 years or 200 years or 400 years. And if you go to the history of old cities, they're one of the few kinds of infrastructure that endures. So it's very important that it be built at a quality uh, and an attractiveness that it will endure. Thank you. Having uh, spent a, a career of 31 years with, in publishing with Southern Living Magazine, uh, I'm going to point out that the publishing, republishing an Olmsted plan has generated a, a lively new uh, engagement in, in the Birmingham metropolitan area. Uh, I, when I was on the Loeb Fellowship at Harvard uh, in 83, 84, I, uh, Dr. Albert Fine told us every, at the end of a, uh, every chance he had to, that we had to teach, uh, write our own landscape history. And, when I got back to Birmingham with the Birmingham Historical Society, we published um, a journal on uh, tracing the work of landscape architects in, in uh, Birmingham. 
Uh, and uh, it, Birmingham, is, uh, as Eric mentioned, was an industrial city. As soon as when it uh, left the valley and the grid, uh, it hit at the right time when uh, a local developer, a very uh, far-sighted local developer, Robert Jemison Jr., brought in landscape architects, mainly from Boston and New York, to help shape uh, suburban development on that very difficult topography. So we had a, a, um, a quite a history of it. Uh, when we did that history, uh, wrote that journal, uh, we published uh, the, the we, only, we actually dis rediscovered in the public library one copy of the 1925 Olmsted Brothers plan for a park system for, for the city of Birmingham. Um, it, uh, it, was, um, it was not uh, followed, and there were probably good reasons. The valleys that they had proposed linear uh, parks along the creeks were actually uh, heavily industrialized. They had railroads, they had mining, uh, lots of conflicts. This uh, large meadow here became, in 1931, the city's airport where it is still today. So this is an unrealized plan in the deepest sense. Um, but we did get it published, and it just happened to hit uh, when the Corps of Engineers uh, was spending $40 million to remove houses that the Olmsted should not said should never have been built in, the, uh, in those uh, um, stream sides. So it, it created quite a public stir because it was the, the plan that wasn't followed that, that cr had great uh, negative effects. Um, so the Birmingham Historical Society went on to republish the 1925 plan in, its, in entirety. And also then the year, a year later, uh, uh, this is in 2005, uh, published a Olmsted vision which was, was starting to say what, was the, what this republication or rediscovery of the plan was starting uh, to generate. Uh, one of the things that, that, um, that uh, was uh, implemented in that larger regional plan that extended beyond the city was the, uh, the development of Mountain Brook, which is just over the ridge from downtown, 1926, Warren Manning, this is Warren Manning's bird's eye view of a plan, a very Olmsteadian plan, and at which one of the recommendations of the regional plan was for, to uh, protect this creek, Shades Creek, and also the crest of, of the ridge above it. All that was done by uh, developer Jemison using Warren Manning uh, and as part of, an, of, of a private development. It still, it was incorporated to the city of Mountain Brook in 1942 and well protected since to the point that, uh, that you can still see the completed ridge this was protected by large estate zoning, but it, and the creek runs below it. Uh, so it was protected partly as public landscape incorporated into the city, but partly as, as development. Uh, more recently, Nimron Long and Associates, uh, over the past 15 years or so, has picked up that armature of green and developed a complete uh, system of 40 miles of, of pedestrian uh, connections between the three commercial villages and all the other features of the city. So this is sort of for, uh, uh, we're the kind of the opposite of the other Jefferson County that we just heard about. Uh, Birmingham is very, uh, metropolitan area is very fragmented. There are 38 different um, municipalities in Jefferson County alone, and we do not have a consolidated anything. So I guess we'll, we'll have to serve as a model of, can you do it despite all those other kinds of negatives? The good thing about this is it's, it's served as a very good model for other, uh, other communities in the, uh, in the region. The other thing we had was a county, Jefferson County, um, that um, was never interested in doing open space or any larger idea of conception of place. They were mainly interested in sewers, and they weren't even very good at sewers because we wound up with a huge EPA uh, lawsuit and, and not, uh, $1 billion in repairs. And what did happen by default, rather uh, ironically, was that the $30 million fine to the EPA instead was dedicated to acquiring uh, land along major creeks and rivers. And the Freshwater Land Trust was created to, to do that. They did their job. They bought, over 10 years, bought 4,000 acres and actually used the Olmstead, original Olmstead regional and city plan as a model. In fact, in one case, one of the suggestions for purchase of property was actually activated 80 years later uh, under the Freshwater Land Trust. So the, the, 
that plan had some legs after all. Uh, what, uh, what has happened since, uh, the Freshwater Land Trust, uh, once it finished that, that remedial work along the, the creeks, uh, decided to pursue a larger regional uh, open space or connected uh, trails plan and created something called R1 Mile. Uh, and the concept there was to make it very participatory and uh, with all kinds of, of uh, meetings, but also an online uh, network where you actually could go in and make comments on all the proposed routes and also suggest new ones. It was uh, listed as something like 3,000 uh, responses, so it was kind of using the, the new media to, uh, to engage this large public. And uh, the result of, resultant plan, they named the Red Rock Ridge and Valley a trail system. It's, uh, it covers uh, quite a large area, and uh, I'll just point out a few. The, the, because it is um, uh, such a uh, mixed uh, uh, mosaic of communities, uh, the Five Mile Creek uh, Trail, for example, up here, uh, is actually being done by a cooperative, signed cooperative agreement between six municipalities, the county, Jefferson County, and three nonprofits. So it's becoming the model on, and it's just beginning, but it's starting to work quite well, of how you can create this kind of regional uh, connection, even if you don't have a regional government or a regional agency to do it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, the, the, the Mountain Brook, original Mountain Brook uh, uh, Creekside has been extended and will be continued to, to be extended all through this valley, Shades Valley here. And then the, uh, what's called the Jones Valley Trail uh, actually runs through the heart of the city and it actually is putting linear open space where the Olmstead plan originally suggested it. So we're, it's a, a question of recovery. Uh, just to point out a few of the uh, active projects on it now, that might be a little hard to read. That's, a, that's an iron ore rail line that went down to the valley from, from Red Mountain where the iron ore came from. Uh, there's now a 29 mile segment of this trail coming uh, through this area and right through the heart of the city that's been funded by a Tiger Grant and a $5 million, $10 million target, uh, Tiger Grant and a $5 million local match. And that is uh, uh, under construction. This is Red Mountain Park. Uh, um, um, the, it's a, um, it's a, an irony of the, um, the, the large scale industrial ownership that precluded uh, Birmingham developing an open space system when it was an, uh, actively an industrial city is now facilitating it because this wasn't a, this, that was not a multiple purchase. That was one purchase, almost 1,200 uh, 1, acres, four and a half miles to the top of Red Mountain where the iron ore mines were all bought in one purchase from U.S. Steel. So it's kind of working the other way now. We can, these properties uh, are available. This is a plan by Wallace, Roberts, and Todd for uh, for Red Mountain. This is a, uh, a before, of, uh, this is not a nature preserve. This is what the mountain looked like when it was being, being mined. Uh, and that's what it will look like when it becomes part of Red Mountain Park. This is a mining, number 10 mine. That's number 10 mine as being interpreted under the park plan. This is the Round the Mountain Trail, which will follow the uh, uh, original mine, uh, ore line that took the iron ore off the mountain down into the valley. And this, this is actually carrying right into the heart of the city now. Uh, uh, this is, uh, there was also parallel to the development of the Red Rock Ridge and Valley Trail, a, a uh, development of th uh, major new parks, regional scale parks. This one happens to be uh, just 19 acres, but uh, it's in the heart of town, and that's the before, uh, uh, and this is what's there now, uh, as of three years ago. So it's a, uh, I guess we're a, an example of it's never too late, uh, and uh, that these ideas can work in, a, in, a, in the most adverse uh, regional conditions. Thank you.
you're a great audience, and now is your time for questions. Let me suggest Robert has a hard departure time of 3.30, so if you have questions for him, I'd like to take those first. Yes, ma'am. Arlene. Microphone folks, here. Folks can wait till I bring the microphone around to you. That'd be great. Robert, um, Arlene, yeah. I've always had this curious feeling about, I don't know whether they're in your records, but when I was listing the three Olmstead transformative periods, I wondered if he had written that in 1929, his Harvard reunion, he would have included yeah. the city plan, the regional plan association, as being so collaborative, instructive. My question is really two parts. That's one. Yep. And secondly, how did he end up with Long Island, of all the possibilities? <laughs> I don't know the answer uh, to, to either of those two questions. You know, so sorry about that. But uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, th there is a there there is a uh, very extensive uh, RPA archive at Cornell that I that I wasn't able to dig into. But I think you know we all need to. If there's interest, I'd you know, love to work with you to, uh, to to find the answers to those to those questions. You know, I I I do know that you know he was you know it's something that he stayed with. For a number of years, which suggests as a very busy guy, he didn't have to stay with with New York and with with the regional plan. I just think he found this to be, in in many ways, this was the kind of collaboration, this was the kind of, of project that he'd been advocating for decades, and and he found he found, and uh, the kind of uh, uh, in, you know is a kind of institutional approach. I mean, the notion of a civic led. Uh, Planning initiative uh, that that looked like it had uh, some staying power, I think, appealed to him. Uh, you, you know, I do know that the 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 Long Island uh, uh, survey ended up being uh, perhaps uh, the most important one in the sense that it became uh, the first place that Robert Moses really um, really implemented his vision for for the for the state park uh, system. And for the parkway system, which very closely followed Olmsted's uh, uh, proposals, uh, so but but some fascinating uh, you know uh, areas to work on for all of us. <coughs> yeah. Well, I you know it's, and I'll send you my notes because we did we did uh, find in RPA's own archives you know and again we still have some of some of the. Library still with us. Most of it went to, to Cornell about 20 years ago, just because we didn't have room in our offices in Manhattan for all these old files. Um, and uh, what we uh, what we we did find a reference to uh, there were plans that were done uh, for uh, for the city of Brooklyn in in the late uh, 90s, I think, or the mid 90s, something like that. And then uh, which and then and then later on for the city of New York that looked at. The, the East River waterfront, uh, and 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 there were a series. Of, uh, those plans were all incorporated into the into the regional plan later on. One of the things that you know I found over the years is that is that uh, uh, you know, and, and I think part of the, the business of, the, of these collaborations is that is that you know a good regional plan is really is something that that pulls in good ideas mm -hmm. from a number of di different disciplines. That you know they're all. A lot of good ideas out there that have been kicking around in many cases that 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 just haven't been picked up on, for you know for for a number a number of years. Uh, and uh, Lewis Mumford was very critical of the of the first regional plan. He he called it a, a a porridge or a gumbo, you know, with a lot of chunks and so forth. But the whole idea was to was to assemble uh, all of the good ideas that that had that had come in from all over the region, and uh, uh, and, and then to organize them into a coherent whole. And, and, I, and I think that's part of what, you know, Olmsted appreciated about the process. But we, we, we need to do some more work on this. Great. We have a question here, I think, and then one in the back. Yeah, a question about um, for the fourth regional plan in terms of the response to sort of the aftermath of uh, Superstorm Sandy and yeah. the likelihood of future things, how are you going to deal with uh, those coastal areas, low-lying coastal yeah, yeah. areas, and then also the political realities that you're facing in the three states. Robert, would you repeat the question so people in the yeah, the here. question is uh, how are we responding in the fourth regional plan? We're, we've just you know begun work on the fourth plan. It's a three-year long process, and the question was uh, how are we responding to Sandy and to the larger questions of climate change, 
Um, and, and then the, the, the second question is, uh, is how do we deal with the political realities? So if you think Birmingham, you've got, uh, uh, or Birmingham, you've got uh, <laughs> problems. Uh, you know, we, we have a, uh, almost a thousand municipalities and three states, and it's like, pl it's like uh, plate tectonics, you know, they really don't get along very well. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, it's really interesting to watch the di dynamics between Governors Cuomo and Christie, you know, they just, <laughs> um, you know, like each other. Is to, uh, you know, is to is to find the common ground to see to find the places where they need to collaborate. Uh, you know, we're, we've been working, for example, on a project to extend the path uh, transit system one mile, or it's 1.8 miles, or something like that, to Newark Airport. And uh, you know, it's not a new idea, but we collaborated with the Downtown Alliance on this thing. We had to make it Governor Christie's idea, which we've managed to do. And and so there's, a, and I call it no fingerprint planning. You know, and and. Uh, <laughs> You know, so it's all done very quietly behind the scenes and so forth, but you get the two governors to agree on something that they might not, you know, naturally agree on, but th that benefits both states. And, um, on the Sandy question, uh, we've worked very closely with, you know, I was on the Governor Cuomo's uh, 2100 commission. We worked very closely with the mayor's office uh, on the city's very thoughtful response to Sandy. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. I live in, in Stanford. Connecticut, which is a, a city for just, you know, 37 miles east of, of New York City. It's one of three cities in the country with a hurricane barrier. And you ask the question, well, how did we get a hurricane barrier? And the answer is we had not one, but two disastrous hurricanes within a generation, each one of which killed a lot of people and caused hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage. And, uh, you know, as my friend Bill McDonough likes to say, you know, we think we're really smart as a species, but, it, you know, after all, it took us 10,000 years to put wheels on luggage. We're not that smart. And, <laughs> And, 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 I've, and, and if, you look at, if you look at how the Thames barrier happened or how, uh, how the Dutch built a 46-foot oh, high yeah. barrier around the entire herb, you know, densely populated area of the Ronstadt in the Netherlands, the answer is two storms within a generation killing a lot of people. Now, I thought Irene did the job, but Irene didn't do a lot of damage, and I'm not convinced that we got the message, and, and we probably need a second storm. I, I, I believe, and there are probably a handful of other people who believe that we need a, a surge barrier, um, and, uh, uh, you know, the mayor doesn't agree with that. He told me, he said, King Canute, you know, couldn't keep out the flood, so how could I? And I said, well, King Canute didn't have an airplane, and you go to Bermuda every weekend, so it's a... <laughs> But I, I, so I just think, but we're dealing with it, we're going, you know, and I think it's a big issue for all of us that, that uh, the, the next generation of regional plans have got to, you know, have, uh, and particularly for coastal cities like, like ours, uh, or this one, you know, we're the, we're the most vulnerable places in, 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 you know, some of the most vulnerable places in the world to, uh, to storm surges, and we're going to have to start uh, pl planning for it. Um, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the, the very first thing that we do, not the last thing that we do. But I don't think we've quite gotten the message yet. Mother Nature will get us the message, however. There's one more question for Robert in the back, and then I'm going to hold there so we have uh, opportunity for others. Yes. Um, in, in a couple of your comments, you alluded to the Clean Water Act. Um, Eric, I think you mentioned it as a way of leveraging money to buy more parkland. Uh, there's a couple things with the Clean Water Act that are driving a lot of communities. One is combined sewer operations, separating those. Uh, the other is stormwater. Uh, and while that may be used creatively for the acquisition of parkland, are, do any of you have any experience in using that as a way of sustaining the cost of maintaining parkland? Well, a big, it goes back to the same question. A big part of what we're going to need to do you know, uh, to respond to climate change is, is doing a better job of managing uh, stormwater. You know, we've had uh, uh, a whole series of uh, major rainfall events in the New York in the New York City area in the, in the last uh, the last uh, few years. You know, we had I guess it's what four or five years ago uh, we had a we had a storm that had nine inches of rain within about five hours, put most of the New York City transit system underwater. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've got to fundamentally redesign these, the, 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 the infrastructure, but we also need to do a much better job of managing uh, stormwater. The, the Mayor Bloomberg, you know, has led an effort, uh, his administration, you know, really creative uh, approach to, uh, to introducing stormwater management. It's part of the Plan YC process, the city's sustainability plan. The other thing, I want to mention that, you know, one of the projects that we worked with, uh, with we've worked with three mayors on now, um, 
in the New York City watersheds in the Catskills, one of our regional reserves is the, is the whole Catskill Delaware watershed. There's about a million acres up there. The city has spent you know, over a billion dollars now uh, buying conservation land, doing, uh, installing wastewater collection and treatment systems in the little villages and towns up in, the, up in the, this watershed that's 100, 150 miles away from New York City. You know, I remember we had one project that I had to sell to the Giuliani administration, which was a, a, a series, a, a grants program to farmers you know, in the in the outer reaches of the watershed in, in Delaware County, to to manage uh, uh, manure piles and and wastewater, you, know, you just couldn't believe the reaction I got from the mayor's office. Uh, you know, on th on that one, <laughs> you want us to do what? Uh, and uh, but it was the uh, key to getting EPA to to allow uh, to give the city a waiver on the Clean Water Act requirements that 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 urban uh, water supplies be filtered. New York City has the has the only it's the the only big city in the country that has an unfiltered water supply. We saved $12 billion in, in what today would be a $20 billion filtration plant. It was going to cost like a billion dollars a year to operate the plant. So for, you know, for a tiny fraction of the, of, of the cost of doing that, we, we were able to, uh, to protect the water supply. question here. I'm Thomas Adretta Mishler. I'm the CEO and President of the Buffalo Homestead Parks Conservancy. And I wanted to ask uh, the panelists about sustainability. And in particular, uh, it's wonderful that you're building these amazing new parks. I'm just wondering, how are you sustaining the, the long-term care of these parks as they develop? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. That's probably the number one question that I get um, in public meetings. And so, um, I talked about the capital side of this project. We raised $121 million, which is a lot of money anywhere in Louisville. It's a ton of money. And the arguments that Robert just talked about are precisely the arguments we used. I have a little slide deck that has, you know, talks about quality of life and economic development and health and so on. And it really is something that you can sell to a broad group. Um, but the other component of our project is that our commitment to the city um, out of that $121 million, the city put in a million and a half, and we committed that we would raise all of the funds for operations and maintenance, and that we would build an operations and maintenance team to maintain the parks. Um, uh, I give Betsy Rogers credit for all that. We model ourselves very much on the Central Parks Conservancy. Um, it's you know kind of a different, slightly different relationship with the city. We have three ways of doing it. Um, we have an endowment. We've raised about $25 million in endowment. Um, little side note, 10 million of those dollars have been invested um, in three parcels of real estate around the park. Um, that is for two reasons. One, uh, eventually we will uh, fund the, you know, the, the long-term maintenance out of selling that real estate. The second is because we really have not been able to engage the city in a thoughtful exploration and a plan of how development uh, will take place around this park. And eight of the 10 fastest growing census tracts in the 2010 census are in or, or right next to our project area. So the growth is there. We're gonna hopefully you know, set the model of what we think good development around the park is. So leg number one is endowment. Leg number two is earned income. I pointed out that one building, the Geens Foundation Lodge, um, which, um, this year, our, we opened it in February. Uh, we broke even this year. Um, we've done, well, by the end of this year, we'll have done about 250 events in that building, and we've already booked about 100 next year. So, um, and then we have other uh, earned income opportunities. And then the third is, like any other nonprofit, we have an annual fundraising strategy. And so, you know, we spent five years learning how to do capital fundraising. Now we're trying to learn how to do annual fundraising, but we'll have events. Um, we've rolled out a kind of a membership product. Our goal is 1,000 members this year. Um, we're at about 900 right now with two and a half months to go. So those are the three legs, and we are absolutely committed to funding that long-term uh, sustainability. And, you know, we're still sort of learning how to do it, but we're quite confident that we will do so. All right. Here she comes. My question is from the two presenters on Louisville. Downtown Louisville has also a parkway system, which you did not talk about. And the regional park system that you're creating could have similar sorts of linear links that involve 
motor transportation, bicycles, and so on. Uh, what thought have either of you given to extending the parkway system of Louisville? Eric, do you want to? Well, I think, uh, Alex, the, um, uh, I did mention very slightly that the connection was there. But you're right, the, uh, the parkway uh, component, which was internal to the city, connected the three parks. Uh, and at this stage, uh, I'm actually go going to ask my colleague, uh, David Rouse, uh, who did some planning on uh, Louisville and Jefferson County. And uh, David, did the question of extending the parkways uh, arise during the course of your, your tenure? Uh, the, because I, I will say that the, um, you know, from our, our understanding, uh, the parkway system within the city was a, a closed system that was not going to be extended beyond that. And the parkway concept of a linear green belt was expressed primarily in this pedestrian uh, route that was going to be a sort of a complete streets connection peripherally. Uh, it would be hoped then that the, the city uh, would extend complete streets out radially into there. But David, maybe you have some insight into that from your... This, am I now? Okay, good. I, I, the, my short answer was no. Uh, the, 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 the project that I was involved in was called the Cornerstone 2020 Comprehensive Plan. And I don't, I, I don't re really recall the idea of extending the parkways come up in that process. However, Eric is correct, and he was kind to give me credit for that, for the concept. I think others were involved. But what did come up was the idea of greenway trails along the major stream corridors, including Floyd's Fork, and this idea of the perimeter trail, the, what, which has now become the Louisville Loop, which I think is a fantastic, because it's an idea of how an, a big idea that came out of a plan can actually get implemented through, really, the work and commitment at the local level by the folks of Louisville. Yeah, um, my perspective is that there's been zero planning on it. There is a comprehensive plan, but it's more a kind of conceptual uh, plan. We supported a plan for the city to look at roads around our project. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, I think this is true in a lot of cities. And, I, the, you know, one of the sort of catchphrases that I use all the time is cities have both cores and edges. And, um, you know, rightly so, we have spent the last, you know, 30, 40 years really, really focused on the core. And we should continue to focus on the core. My office is in the core. Um, but, a lot of the growth takes place at the edge. And I think, and this is me as a non-planner, you can take it for what it's worth, but there's a lot of hand-wringing about sort of sprawl and, and so on. But, but my experience with planners is that they don't like the edge. Um, they're not interested in the edge. In many cases, they're quite negative about the edge. And, and my mantra is it doesn't matter if you're Louisville or Paris or you know whatever, cities have cores and edges. It's, it's a spatial fact. You can't have a you know, a, a piece of ground and not have those things. And uh, they, you should really think in, in, uh, as a profession about both the core and the edge. Everything that Olmsted Jr. did to me, I mean, he, he worked in the core, but so much of it was about the edge and thinking about, you know, in Baltimore, I mean, I learned all this today as, it, as those annexations uh, came in, how do we integrate those into the city? And, you know, Louisville, you know, what is pretty much downtown 200 years ago was the edge. So, um, and our politicians are scared of the edge. It's very controversial, and consequently, we have uh, very little planning on the edge, in my opinion. There are some ideas, but not really enactable ideas. Let me make a quick comment, Dan, for you. Your principle uh, relative to investing in the green infrastructure first is absolutely right. That's one of the requirements for our belt line. So no green infrastructure investment, no development. So let me just tell you, that's very good and to continue to push that perspective. Please join me uh, in thanking our outstanding panel. Thank you.